across the waters, you know what I'm saying, uh, living currently in the nation of Ghana, kings and queens in West Africa, brother Obadele Kambon. Our subject is, our subject is the ancient origins of Pan-Africanism. Once again, the ancient origins of Pan-Africanism. I know a lot of you have been looking forward to this one, so I want to just shout out, uh, big up Auntie Makeda, who's in the house, in the house from early. Uh, big up Daisy Ross, big up the um, Solo the Pro, um, and also big up my brother M. A. Brown. Greetings and welcome to all those who are entering the conversation uh, right about now. Um, I want to let you know a few things. Bring up DC Brad once again for the live chat, getting in there early. There's the super chat and that, you know what I'm saying? We give tags, you know what I'm saying? Um, yes, um, this brother woke me up. So, uh, brother Obadele, your, your, your reputation precedes you, my brother, because, uh, you know, there's, there's people here saying that you woke them up, you know what I'm saying? So, we give thanks uh, for all your efforts. Right, but I'm going to introduce brother Obadele in a second. I do just want to let you know um, however, that we are doing something special. Yeah, we are doing something special uh, for this particular conversation. Um, and that is, uh, considering the fact that Brother Obadele is not just a scholar, Brother Obadele is an institution builder. And one of the institutions that he has built is Abibitumi TV. Abibitumi, uh, spoken in the Akan of Tree language, uh, translates literally uh, as Black Power, Abibi. Uh, is black and Tumi is power, yeah? And so we are going to be hosting the conversation on this particular platform known as YouTube for now. Once the presentation is completed, the whole conversation is done, I'll be posting an edit, yeah? An edit of the presentation here. And following that, the presentation will be available in full on Abibi Tumi TV. Yeah, so once we conclude this, this video will not be available. You're going to only watch it um, on abibitumitv.com. I'm just going to post that in the chat right about now, yeah, um, so that you can all get it, you know what I'm saying? Um, abibitumitv.com uh, on, my, on my own channel on abibitumitv.com because we have to be building our own platforms, kings and queens, creating our own channels um, and networks for to, 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 you know, to present our own work, you know what I'm saying? Over here, we don't deal with scholarship for the sake of scholarship. All our scholarship has a purpose, um, has an agenda, has a goal. And that goal, in the words of Mama Marimba Ani, uh, is world African sovereignty. So considering the subject of today's presentation, the ancient origins of Pan-Africanism, this is a concept that many of us would have first heard coming from possibly Baba John Henry Clark when he detailed the idea that the origins of Pan-Africanism should be placed uh, with the unification of uh, upper and lower Kemet kings and queens, all right? But few people have decided to go deeper into this particular concept and that particular idea of an ancient origin um, however, you know, as they say, nature abhors a vacuum. And so our brother this evening, who is Obadele Kambon, has actually done that work and is doing that work. He is a senior research fellow at the Institute of African Studies, which is the University of Ghana. He has a PhD in Tri, the Akan language. He speaks, I believe it's four and a half African languages and he is one of the key number one cultural scientists of our era, brothers and sisters. I want to introduce you to Brother Obadele Kambon. Greetings, Hotep, Brother Obadele. Hotep, Hotep, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, we want some red, black, and green in the chat or in the number nine. If you can hear Brother Obadele clearly, you're going to have to bear with us as well, kings and queens, because there is a bit of a delay between my line and Brother Obadele's line. So there's going to be a bit of a delay in the communication, but we'll work with it the same way. Yeah. But if you can hear Brother Obadele um, clearly, then give me some red, black, green colors or the number nine in the chat. Um, and whilst, in order to test that, Brother Obadele, just if there's anything that I left out, yeah, um, in concerning yourself that you know our viewers need to know. Just introduce yourself uh, in brief for the family. 
Okay, so um, as mentioned, I um, actually have my PhD in linguistics. I focused on Asante Chi. Um, I got two masters, one in linguistics and then another uh, masters in African languages and literature. Um, and, you know, basically now I'm on the head of section of the language, literature, and drama section at the Institute of African Studies. A brief, just so we can actually get to the content and topic, but you can also go to abadelecambon.com. Beautiful, beautiful, my brother. Give thanks for that. Give thanks for that introduction. Um, big up to Kwame Akra Nyame Mentu Hotep. Says two of my favorites. Glad you are linked up. I didn't know I was one of your favorites, bro. I give thanks for that. Um, and I'm pleased that Brother Obadele is also one of your favorites. Big up to Brother Kodjo, um, Brother Kwajo, um, uh, Sister Samaya, you know what I'm saying? Gladi, you know what I'm saying? All the people them that are locked in, locked on right about now. Right, bro. I don't want to keep them waiting any longer. So when you're ready, feel free to start sharing your screen. And we're going to get into the ancient, the ancient origins of ancient Kemet. All right. So let me get to it now. While you're doing that, I just want to make brothers and sisters aware of the words of Baba Kwame Toure, who says we should always be in the, uh, uh, engaged in the political education of our people because our enemies are always politically or politicizing us. And so that's the reason why we're doing this, kings and queens, that we don't just engage in scholarship for the sake of scholarship, as I have said before. Right, so we've got the red, black, green. And if you can see Brother Obadele's screen, let me know once again, give me the red, black, green in the chat. And also give me the number nine, um, and or give me the number nine, you know what I'm saying? If you can see Brother Obadele's screen, I'm gonna make it the full screen right about now, so you all can see it. Okay, Brother Obadele, when you're ready, please proceed. All right. Okay, so we have a lot of ground to cover, so um, I'm going to try to be as thorough as possible, but then also, um, you know, look at our time. So this is the ancient Kemet's view origins of Pan-African nationalism, a textual analysis. So we'll set things up first with a little bit of background, and then we'll go directly into those texts that we're speaking of. So from the outset, let's look at modern day Pan-Africanism. So Pan-African was linked to blackness from its very inception. So if you read um, Pan-African history uh, by H. I. D. and Sherwood, they talk about after contacting black people, membership was restricted to those of African descent. That's with regard to the African Association, later referred to as the Pan-African Association. So this was the understanding of the people who invented the word Pan-African that is related to black people. Right. And if you look at the seven goals of the 1900 Pan-African Conference, they mentioned to promote unity, feeling and friendly intercourse among peoples of the Negro slash African race, uh, self-rule with responsible black governments for colonized Negro countries, voting rights for Africans abroad, that is Negroes in the countries of the white race, uh, business interests of Africans abroad uh, to create a great central Negro state in Africa for the black race to secure integrity and independence for self-governing Negro countries, and then also to earn for the Negro race equality with and respect of other races of humanity. And that is from Ma Chimwezu, a colleague here in Ghana. So in the Address to the Nations of the World, you can actually find this in J.A. Langley, 1979. Uh, it mentions directly first Negro states of Abyssinia, Liberia, Haiti, and the rest. It also refers to Negroes of the West Indies, black subjects of all nations to take courage. So again, they're using Negro, African, and black interchangeably. Um, again, it talks about let the British nation uh, give responsible government to black colonies of Africa and the West Indies. So essentially what we're looking at is Pan-Africanism was conceived by and for black people regardless of location, rather than continentalism, which is Arab enslavers, regardless of whether or not they are indigenous, African equals black people. Uh, again, they talk about, as mentioned, a great central Negro state in Africa and its prosperity should be counted in the happiness and true advancement of its black people. So again, they're specific that they're talking about black people, not anyone who happens to be there. So the null hypothesis, Pan-Africanism is regarded as a modern phenomenon 
and a direct response to colonialism, neo uh, colonialism, enslavement, and neo enslavement, and is usually associated with the coining of the term Pan Africanism in English, or retroactively applied to those uh, times immediately preceding the coinage. It's usually tied to Nana Henry Sylvester Williams in the first Pan African Conference in 1900 to promote and protect the interests of African, those people of African blood or descent. Now, one person who says this is Nana Walter Rodney. And one second, one second, one second, no problem. Sorry, bro. You, you, you cut out for a second there, so let's back up like a couple sentences. Okay. Okay. So uh, the no hypothesis that Pan Africanism is usually associated with the coining of the term in English or the period immediately preceding the coining, and is usually tied to Nana Henry Sylvester Williams in the first Pan African Conference of 1900. Now, one person who gives this as an idea, this no hypothesis, is Nana Walter Rodney. And he says that Pan-African sentiments were born in the Caribbean. And he says, and I quote, this was the first area of the world to which Africans were taken to labor as slaves and then immediately thereafter to the rest of the Americas. It is in that context that the very necessity to define oneself as African if one came from the African continent arose. He says prior to that, people would define themselves in terms of ethnic group, clan or village or family group. He also talks about this uh, type of contact based on exploitation of black by white. It is in that situation that the necessity arose for black people to be defined as black. He also further says Pan-Africanism at that point in time uh, was born in substance, even if it was not so regarded, even if the terminology was not applied to that substance. And he talks about the unity, which again, I quote, slaves forge, I prefer enslaved Africans, but uh, this is a quote a commonality which could only be operative when they moved against European exploitation and oppression. And he says it was a question of survival. He also talks about in this context, it was necessary to break down interdistinctions between one African and another. He says the essence of Pan-Africanism Pan in the period when it was born, and he says that's the 15th century, it had to be born in a context where a large number of Africans from different social backgrounds were thrown into a context in which this necessity would arise, right? But we have to ask the question, is that true? Was the 15th century the first time black people came together on the basis of being black, right? Now, Nana Rodney was apparently unaware of the Zanz Revolution, where you had enslaved black people in what is now modern day Iraq near Basra some 600 years prior to the period of which he spoke, the 15th century or the Hyksos invasion of Kemet 3,000 years prior in their enslavement of black people. So if the premise is that it was the Caribbean, the first place in the world that enslaved black people were taken, that first we can understand that premise is not correct, that there were um, cases of black people being enslaved you know, long prior to that. And we can quote Imahu Manetho who says, having overpowered the rulers of the land, and he's talking about the Hyksos and you can see images of the Hyksos on the uh, upper right and lower left. He says that having overpowered the rulers of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, raised to the ground the temples of the gods, and treated all the natives with a cruel hostility, massacring some and leading into slavery the wives and children of others. So again, we have a good 3,000 years prior to this period that he's talking about, um, black people being enslaved by these uh, non-blacks. So our hypothesis is that the concept and practice of unifying African equals black people politically, economically, socially is an ancient African equals black imperative seen in all empires where you see progressively larger socio-political groupings. We can see it in Kush, we can see it in Wenue Congo, Nyani, Wagadu, Gao, Kilwa, so forth and so on and most especially Kemet, the land of black people. And we found that the original foreign policy thrust was to integrate more African black people into Kemet. There was little or no interest in uh, incorporating Amu, these so-called Asiatics, until very late into the history. We'll go a bit into that. Now you mentioned Obinfo, and we like to use terms um, of honor and titles of respect of our ancestors and elders. So Obinfo, Nana John Herman Clark, and Obinfo is someone who is wise, 
skilled, clever, all of these ideas. And he says that he defines Pan-Africanism when he looks all the way back at the historical role and historical manifestations of it. And he deals with the first organized society of the Nile Valley, where people of the South came together uh, to rule a country now known to the world as quote unquote Egypt. The unification of Upper and Lower Nile was an act of Pan-Africanism. Similarly, uh, Obinfo Kwame Nantambu, he also says when Pharaoh Aha, also known as Namur and renamed Menace by the Greeks, united Upper and Lower Kemet into one nation, uh, that this was Pan-African nationalism of the first order, right? And he deals with it in terms of forming one country uh, in order to be able to resist foreign aggression and invasion into Alia. So again, this point was made by uh, Nana John Henry Clark as early as 1994, um, and we even found speeches uh, to that point earlier. And then 1998, Nana uh, Kwame Nantambu making a similar point. We also see Ata Aikoyama making the same point in Remembering the Dismembered Continent, where he says, if Pan-Africanism is the ideal of Africans coming together in one polity, history presents earlier examples. Their ethos peaked in the unificatory ideologies that created Egypt thousands of years ago. So, you know, we're having so many who are saying this, but basically what we're going to do is add uh, a little bit more flesh to that uh, skeleton framework that we're starting off with. So first off, in terms of African equals black people, if you look at Faulkner's dictionary, you find that Kim translates to black, right? And then you see Kemet, they translate this as the black land. You see the same root, Kim, here. And then you see Kemet here, also known as Kemetu, a Nesbi, uh, that's derived. And we see here Kemet, they translate this as Egyptians. It is also transliterated as Kemetu. So when we ask the question of who were the Kometsu, who were the black people, we actually, so, so, okay. yeah, no problem, go ahead, can you hear me? Sorry, the, 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 yeah, the, the viewers um, are, are saying that the, the, the audio is a bit choppy, I'm trying to improve it at the moment, so if, what I'm going to ask you to do is just mute your camera, so keep the presentation where it is, but just, um, just um, turn your camera off, so okay. at the bottom of your screen. You should have you should see it here. I said stop cap. Okay, let me do that. Yeah. That's cool. All right, go back into your presentation now. All right. So I hope that's better. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're hoping so. All right, so continue. I'm, I'm, I'm going to monitor it from here as well. Okay. All right. Continue, my brother. Oh, wait. The, the screen is blank at the minute. Oh, there we go. We're back. We're back. Go ahead. Okay. So we asked the question, who were the Kemet's you? And these are uh, images, uh, photographs that I took in Kemet. You can see very clearly why they call themselves black people when you look at actual photographs of how they depicted themselves, right? I say the one on the uh, top right looks just like my wife, and this one she actually agrees with. Now, according to Mam Sehanta Job, he says the Egyptians had only one term to designate themselves, Kemet, the Negroes literally. This is the strongest term existing in the Farawanic tongue to indicate blackness. He also talks about it's a remarkable circumstance that they didn't apply that term to Nubians and other populations uh, to distinguish them from themselves, that they use the word Nahas, to designate Nubians, right? Now, the earliest attestation that we find of us referring to ourselves as black people is here in what are referred to as a pyramid text, um, that's of um, Nesu Biti, Meri Ra, Sa Ra Pepi, also known as Pepi the first by the uh, Egyptologist. You can see him there on the uh, upper left-hand corner, where it says, you stand in front of the Kometsu like the Apis, that is the Hapu Bo. Now you find these uh, white fraudsters and their uh, black lackeys, if we want to call them black, who say, oh no, this just means uh, the land is black. So this, they say this is a term for a cultivable soil along the banks of the Nile and the Delta, so forth and so on. But again, here you see in um, Kurt Seth, uh, this commit to you right here, right? Now, what's profound about this is that this is well over 4,000 years ago and a good 100 to 200 years before we see it in texts like uh, Imahu Sanhat's text, where he again refers to he's coming down into the land of Kemet. And that's during the uh, so-called first intermediate period. We'll, we'll return to that point. Now, 
if you look at these uh, white fraudsters who you know like to say, oh, it just means the soil is black, that if you read uh, Esna volume three, it talks about um, Ahimtu Khnumre, who um, is the deity, the nature of the potter's wheel, who settled the land by his handiwork. Now, when you have this white Israeli Egyptologist translated, she says, formed all on his potter's wheel, Ta Tenen, who made all that is on their soil. But when you go to the actual Medinetra text, you realize that it doesn't say formed all, it says formed out of ochre, which is a type of soil uh, from elephantine. And then this is the text, this is the screenshot from the text, Nehep Sin Cheru Er Nehepef, which has formed them of ochre on his potter's wheel. And here we see uh, Chur here, and again it translates to mineral material from elephantine brought among others as a material for little figurines. And we saw that image of a figurine uh, earlier, the one that I've said on the top right looked like my wife, right? And this is uh, from Sonoran Le Temple des Volume 3, right? Now, for those who may not be aware, Elephantine, this is an island in the middle of uh, Ichiru Hapi. And basically what you had was a situation where anytime you had this inundation and the overflowing of the river, that that black silt would wash up on that island. And they're saying that that's the specific place where they would get that, this black silt. However, you still have all these fakers and fraudsters who uh, give us these reproductions and counterfeit fakes, where this is a photograph on the far left that I took of um, Hamed Nesut Nefertiti, and here you see her in her full lips and full nose, but very few of us see this image. We tend to see this fake one that was composed uh, 1911 to 1912. Here you see an image of uh, Nesut Biti Tutankhamun, and you see him depicted by people who looked at him, but then they want to do a computer regeneration, which looks absolutely nothing like those who actually saw him depicted him, right? And then we see this, you know, by and large, all these fake uh, movies and so forth and so on, that if you followed all this stuff, you would be like, okay, well, the people of ancient Egypt, and this is even why they like to use the term ancient Egypt, because if you use the term Kemet and Kemet's you, you would be struck by the, the fact that these people called themselves black people. Now, this is an actual photo where you see the image of Ramech, right? And Ramech was another term that was used referring to what they uh, like to translate as quote unquote Egyptians. And we see uh, Hornung mislabels a black skin group A as Nubians, even though the, the text clearly reads Ramech, i.e. the Kemetsu or quote unquote the Egyptians. It's clear that uh, he distorts or mislabels it. And you can look this uh, information up from Prof. Manu Ampim, who gives a very thorough expose of Kwanon and Yoko, these fake fraud white Egyptologists who intentionally mislabel, distort, and misrepresent the truth. And here again, you see uh, Kemet used as an adjective here, or let's say a modifier would be a more appropriate term. So you see Amat Kemet, right? Amat Kemet, so Amat being mud and then Kemet being black. And one thing that we're all aware of, for those who study Medunetra, is that this modifier is going to agree in uh, gender and then also in number. So whereas you would have Kem here as a dictionary uh, definition, because Amat is feminine, then you get Kemet also agreeing for gender and number. And you can see this usage in what they refer to as the Ebers Papyrus, and the citation is here. Um, now, another thing that comes up is that in the text, you see here that you have this amat, amat, and here you see a determinative letting you know that you're dealing with uh, irrigated land or a boundary, but in what you see in the uh, translation here by Walter Rosinski is that he does this as a new bowl. Now, they look similar, but they're actually different, but we'll come back to that point. And again, you see as you stand in front of the Kometsu black people, like the Apis, and here you see the determinative of a village with the crossroads. Now, again, you can look at mankind of Kemet. Here you see Ramesh translating as men, mankind, Egyptians, Ramesh, men, mankind, so forth and so on. But that brings up the question of, well, how were they depicting themselves? You can see very clearly here you see the Ur, the Ch, man, woman, plural and they're depicted as black red than a thousand midnights. 
And then the cutout that you saw was above their heads, Ramech, right here. And again, it becomes very clear of why they call themselves Kometiu, that is black people. And here you see a reproduction of the tomb of uh, Nesubiti, Ramesu, Mary, Amen, Heka, Unu. And you see the Ramech are depicted as two types on the far left here. And then the Nahasu depicted as two types, third from the left. Now, what uh, Mam Sehant Job used to always show is that the Ramech and the Nahasu are depicted culturally and then also phenotypically as being virtually the same. The difference is you see an extra red line here on the sash of the uh, Ramech here. And again, you can see the dictionary definitions of all of these. And interestingly, Ramasu, uh, Mary Amun Haka Unu, what the whites like to call Ramesses the third, he's depicting himself as the Ramech that you see up here on the top. Now, another term that I would like to introduce is Amu, right? These are non-blacks. And usually when I translate this, I translate this as Eurasians. And one is because Eurasia, this is one single continent, that uh, the idea that Europe is a continent is something that with our own eyes we can see is not true. If you look at a satellite image of a map, you can see very clearly that Eurasia is one landmass. That's one. But then two, our non-black enemies come from that entire continent. So we refer to them as Eurasians because they're coming from the continent of Eurasia. But the term that was used in a similar way as a catch-all term for anyone who comes from the continent of Eurasia was Amu. And you can see this in uh, the text of Nesu Biti Ramesu Usur Ma'at Rasetepenra, who the Egyptologists call Ramesses II for short, uh, where he says, what is your opinion of these Amu, Eurasians, O Amen, wretches who are ignorant of the nature? So what they did is, in this context, he's grouping Pitasa, which is Western Anatolia, uh, Hati, Central Anatolia, which is capital of Hattusa, Charchemish, also known as Karkamish, uh, in what's now modern day Syria, Mitanni, um, or Naharin, in texts uh, text that we see in Northern Syria, Southeast Anatolia, Ugarit, in Northern Syria, Seha Riverland in Western Anatolia, Kadesh. So he's looking at all of these non-black people. He's referring to all of them with one catch-all phrase, which is Amu. So you had a coalition of all these Amu, and he's saying to Amen, what do you think of these Amu, these wretches who are ignorant of the nature? So when we're using the term uh, Eurasian, is to capture the essence of what our uh, ancestors from Kemet used to use in terms of a catch-all term for these non-black enemies of black people. Now, another thing I'd like to point out is this relationship between Amu and Seth. So it's important to note that you have this idea that, one, the people themselves said that they're made of black soil from Abu. But in addition to that, they also focus on Ra and the idea that the more one is exposed to light, the blacker that one becomes. Conversely, the one more is exposed to dark, the lighter one becomes. So it's no wonder that the Kometiu associate non-black Amu with the sunlight blocking clouds of Seth, who was in turn identified with storm, right? So you see Neshmi and you see the Seth animal there on the storm clouds. In Kani, storm, storm clouds that blotted out the light of the sun to the point that the Seth animal featured as a determinative in the words for both. So the connection between the Amu and Seth was similarly articulated by Sara Kamos, who stated regarding the non kometi non-black Amu, a ruler of the Hyksos, he says, then Nesut Ipepi made for himself Seth as Neb, right? They usually translate that as Lord, but that has a lot of medieval uh, England connotations, but made for himself Seth as Neb, and did not serve any nature who was in the land in its entirety except Seth. So this is according to Sara Kamesu, and similarly, we find uh, Nesut Biti Hatshepsut, who is saying that they've ruled without Ra, right, which is translated as the sun. So these people of the darkness, these people of the storm clouds are ruling without Ra, right? And it's very interesting that those who are associated with that, which blocks out the sun, are the same ones who are non-black, whereas those who are black are very much centered and focused on Ra and Heru and other manifestations of Ra. 
Now we see in uh, another text, which is referred to as a cycle of hymns to sin wolves writ, where it says he came and ruled the black land. Now this is a translation from a white Egyptologist and she also translates it as he came and nourished the black land. But what we see in the text itself, when you go to the Medunetra, is the same thing that we saw in the dictionary definition. In Kemet, you see man, woman, and then plural marker. So what it actually says is he came and ruled the black people. He came and nourished the black people, right? So you can find this in uh, Francis Llewellyn Griffith, uh, Hieratic Papara from Cahun and Guru. And you can actually see the Medunetra with the man, woman, and plural without that uh, determinative of human settlements. Now again, to the point of depicting the Nahasiu, what they refer to as Nubians, as the same as Kemetiu, is here we see above his head, it says that this is one of the Nahas, right, Nahasi. And you see him depicted the exact same as the Kemetiu here on the top row and then also on the lower row as they're carrying their standards, much like it's done in modern day Ghana, where they still have these standards that they carry, the Ochiame Puma, as it's called. Now again, back to who the black people were, uh, Mam Sech Ante Job did a melanin test, and with this, he got some square millimeters of mummified skin, which he then coated in ethyl benzoate and exposed to natural or ultraviolet light, and that rendered the melanin granules fluorescent, enabling them to be counted. And what he said was that they show a melanin level which is non-existent in white skin races. Let us simply say that the evaluation of melanin level uh, and enables us to classify the ancient Egyptians unquestionably among the black races. And incidentally, um, Baba Anthony Browder, uh, he also talks about it, we will say Okunini, which is a title preferable to doctor, that what he actually says is that this is something that's still used to this day in order to identify burn victims, this process that was pioneered by Mam Sikh Antajo. Tendamwari greetings, family. Thank you for watching the presentation so far. As explained at the beginning of the video, you will be able to see Brother Obadele's presentation in its entirety at abibitumitv.com. Abibitumitv.com. The link is in the description. So click the link below in the description to be taken to abibitumi.com where you'll be able to see the entire presentation, including the question and answer. Abibitumi TV is run by Brother Obadele Kambon and is a portal for you to engage in black african conscious visual content in its abundance kings and queens so while you're there do support the thing sign up create an account i uh, look forward to seeing you over there we'll be back soon very very soon uh, with more from shakara speaks until such time hotep tendamwadi african power for all african people